the rapture. The rapture came, you'd be gone. <laughs> so now he says here in verse 8 that they are affectionately desirous of you. And this is very much the mentality of the mature Christian towards the new convert and younger believers. That is the mentality that we should have. I mean, number one is mentality we should have uh, one, and another, one and another to begin with. Uh, but when you're dealing with the new Christian, somebody who's just been saved, somebody who is a, a babe in Christ, uh, they need to be given that attention. Just like any child, any baby, any young child uh, needs to be given a lot more attention than somebody who is more mature, uh, is able to do things on their own, uh, you know, as I mean, that's every parent's goal with their child is to raise them up into a capable, independent adult. Uh, and so that is very much the case here. And he's reminding them of this fact. Uh, you know, it's very much the mentality, or it should be anyways, the mentality of the pastor towards his flock. Uh, the man of God shouldn't have any other attitude towards the sheep that the Lord has put him in charge of than that of love and understanding uh, and the, a willingness, a desire to, to protect them, to help them to grow, to feed them, to be affectionately desirous of you you know I want these things for you I want you to grow in Christ I want you to grow uh, spiritually I want you to grow in knowledge and all the things that come with mature Christianity uh, and of course this is the heart of Jesus Christ towards us you know uh, I mean it was the mentality uh, at heart of Paul towards all his converts. We find that when you read his letters, you're going to see this. Uh, you know, and in Thessalonians, though he, he touches on it very uh, the right uh, expression I'm looking for here. You know, it is important to Paul that he not just reinforces this with them, but comforts them with this so that they understand his purpose, his motives are their good. Again, just like with Jesus Christ. Everything that Christ does in our life is for our good. And that's exactly what Paul's purpose and intent is is for he wants them to understand it because he wants them to understand there are going to be those out there that are not going to be there they're going to come in like these forgers of these letters whose purpose and intent has nothing to do with the care of these people but to attack Paul and so this is that's what he goes on he says we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Again, this should be the mentality, uh, this should be the motivation for every Christian. Uh, number one, not only just with each other, but you know, in particular in dealing with new converts and young Christians. It's very important that they get this from us. Now, I mean, it's the thing with Paul. He wasn't someone who was just going to give somebody the gospel and those that were willing lead them to Christ, you know, and then chug off down the road to the next crowd and, and leave them to fend for themselves. 
He always wanted to spend time where he was uh, to nurture and to teach and to guide these new converts before the Holy Spirit had him move on to the next place. And in fact, we see him, you know, making three different missionary journeys, uh, you know, and each time trying to go back as much as he can to the places where he's already established churches as well as going into new territory to make sure that everything's going good where they're at. A lot of times he can't go there, and that's why the letters, that's why the epistles that he sends out to them. Uh, you know, he doesn't want to, you know, he's not a bean counter, you know, <laughs> turning in his, his sheet <laughs> there and saying, yep, I, you know, I want another 10 people to the Lord, put that up on the tote board and move on, you know. I mean, it, it's wonderful to lead people to Jesus Christ, but if you're not going to be able to disciple them, them themselves, you need to make sure that they're going to be able to be discipled by somebody else. You know, you make sure that, uh, you know, you get them connected with a good church, you know, or you contact, you know, uh, the pastor of a good church, you say, hey, you know, while I was wherever, you know, I, I had a chance to, I led this person to Christ, this, here's their name, they're at, would try, can you try to get a hold of them and meet with them? I've done that more than once in my life where I've contacted churches, other places, uh, because, you know, I either led somebody to Christ there or somebody that uh, we had led to Christ who was young in Christ, was moving uh, to another spot uh, and so forth. So this is really important. And we have that responsibility. We have the responsibility. I mean, every parent has the responsibility to take care of and to raise up their children. You know, and when you lead somebody to Christ, you know, you need to take on that responsibility. You know, you need to uh, make sure they they get a Bible. You know, uh, you know, try to get them to come to church. You know, go pick them up if you need to. You know, get them involved. Uh, help them to grow to the point of uh, being willing to make a, a public. Uh, statement of faith in Jesus Christ and being baptized, you know, and you need to get them into the church, get them coming to Sunday school, get them coming to the services so that they start learning and they can start getting involved. Uh, you know, I mean, I understand people's lives can be busy and you can't always maybe spend a whole lot of time, uh, but I've always had the mentality of quality over quantity. Quality over quantity. I mean, it bothers me when I lead somebody to Christ and I can't get them to let me disciple them. Drives me nuts <laughs> when I can't get them to. You know, it's like, yeah, okay, gee, thanks for showing me how to be saved. Thank you, you know, uh, but both you and Jesus now will leave me alone. You know, uh, happens far too often anymore these days, sadly. Uh, you know, and, and I'll be honest, it's one of the problems I had where I was going to school studying is we supposedly would have, I mean, I'm talking hundreds saved every week. Uh, and, you know, and, but the numbers of them that I saw show up to church, the numbers of them that I saw who were actually getting discipled and who actually went on to, and, you know, and a lot of that was simply because of the fact of it was, you know, counting numbers, counting numbers, you know, and I mean, praise God for every soul that gets saved. 
but there's so much more. And we're not doing right by them, and we're certainly not doing right by Jesus Christ when we don't do these things. I mean, we, we need to be affectionately desirous of the new convert. You know, one of the things, you know, and that's why this last Sunday we were sharing our uh, conversion experiences, is we need to remember our own salvation and what occurred. You know, uh, you know, and, you know, how we came to know Christ and what it was and, you know, how did we, you know, were, how were we discipled? How were we led along? You know, and, and these kinds of things that remember, you know, what did and didn't happen and say, okay, yeah, boy, I wish this had been done and didn't that make it? Well, make sure you then do those things. Or, yeah, this was really great that this was done. Say, okay, well, then, you know, make sure that, that you do that thing. Uh, you know, this is a real important item that we do uh, when it comes to this. I mean, all the Thessalonians were all new Christians. I mean, there, were, there wasn't a mature Christian in the bunch. <laughs> I mean, these are all new. you got an entire church. It's all baby Christians here. Uh, and no new Christian knows how to grow, knows how to build their lives and their strength up in, in spiritually. And, they don't know any of that. You know, that just like any newborn baby, they have to be taught and they have to be showed these things, okay? And it needs to be done in love and reinforced with love. You know, and this, this is what's important. And if they don't know, not just think, but if they don't know that they are dear to those who are, you know, maybe the one who led them to Christ and the elders and their mentors in the church, okay, I can tell you what's going to happen. They're going to end up feeling like they've been used. Okay? Uh, you know, when they get used, you know, to glorify one's own self, uh, used to build up the church's ego. Uh, and again, I've seen this. I've seen this, okay? When, they, when you have to turn in a report card, <laughs> uh, you know, of your soul-winning efforts, you know, in a week, uh, and you know you're you are, I don't care what they say you're judged. Oh, okay. Well, you, you didn't lead anybody to Christ this week. You didn't lead anybody to Christ last week. You know what's wrong with you? You know how come this guy over here led ten? You know. Uh, but again, I mean, who's getting the glory out of that? Certainly not the Lord, and certainly not the people who are being led to Christ. You know, like I say, I've seen it. Soul winning needs to be sincere. Discipleship needs to be sincere. Fellowship needs to be sincere. It's just the same as pastoring needs to be sincere. You know, uh, it, none of it should be lip service. None of it should be, you know. Okay, yeah, I've done what I got to do, and now, you know, I don't have time for you. You know, uh, you know the the new convert uh, who is is being uh, discipled needs to feel that they can call on that individual whenever they need to. Now, the Christian in the church needs to be able to call on their pastor anytime they need to and know that they're going to get a response and know that the response that they're going to get is honest and sincere. It's about motive. 
We, we always come back to that point in, in the life of the Christian. You know, your motive is what's always key. Motive is the ruler <laughs> by which Christians live by. And it's what they're going to be measured by at the judgment seat of Christ. What was the motive? behind what you did. You know, a lot of people do good things, but the motive in it isn't the right motive. Verse 9, we're going on, talks about labor and travail. Now, Paul labored very fervently in his work of the gospel. He also, though, labored very fervently with his own two hands, as did the, those that were with him on his missionary journeys, to provide for their own physical needs. Okay. Why? Because, it says, uh, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. Go to Acts 18 with me. Acts chapter 18, 1, 2, and 3. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought. For by their occupation, they were tent makers. Okay. He's doing this to support himself and his missionary efforts so as not to be a burden on these new Christians. And again, every church is new. I mean, you outside of somewhere he sent more experienced Christians there, like Silas and Timothy and so on, uh, to be the pastors there, you know, every one of them were new churches, and everybody in the church was a new convert. So he's making sure that nobody can accuse him of doing what he's doing solely for the sake of skimming money, <laughs> you know, sucking money off of uh, these people so he can live high on the hog. And, I mean, the examples of that that are, exist out there today are way too numerous on that. So he's laboring not just in the gospel, but he's laboring with his own two hands. He didn't want to be chargeable to anybody. Uh, in the gospel or in material things. Uh, Romans 13, 8. Romans 13, 8. There we are. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Yeah. He doesn't want to be chargeable to anybody in the gospel. He doesn't want anybody to be able to say, yeah, how come you didn't tell me about Jesus Christ? He doesn't want to be chargeable to anybody for the material needs. Of life, so that again he can't be falsely accused of having an ulterior motive in what he was doing. So, if you have an opportunity to share the gospel with somebody and you don't do so, you owe them. You owe them, and you're going to be chargeable to them. First uh, Corinthians nine. First Corinthians nine, sixteen through twenty-three. 
churches are sticking here together. <laughs> All right, let's see. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. And then uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 78. Moreover, we must have a good report of them which are without, lest we fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. Likewise, must the deacons be great... Oops, I'm in Timothy. Well, it's... <laughs> What was said there, though, was right. We, you know, as far as that goes, and I'm sorry, it's supposed to be in Second Thessalonians, one book too far, uh, three, seven, and eight. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Okay, verse 10, Paul reminds them how he and his missionary associates behaved themselves. And again, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. That's why the church can, takes its doctrine from the Paulian epistles. Okay? Those are the books that are written specifically to the church. Now, there's things in the four Gospels or in any of the other epistles that line up with Paul's doctrine. Fine. If it doesn't, leave it alone. It's not for you. <laughs> Paul puts himself up as the example for the Thessalonians to follow. He does this for the reason that he is the Christ appointed apostle to the Gentiles. Galatians 2. Galatians 2, verses 11 through 16. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I was stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. But before that, Certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles, but when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews disassembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Okay, so he takes Peter to task, okay, as the apostle to the Gentiles, okay, uh, and says, hey, you know, you're, what you're doing here is wrong. Okay, what you're doing is doctrinally wrong, and you're pulling others along with you in it, and you're infecting... <laughs> these Galatians uh, with, you know, so he's, 
you know, he's very adamant about this responsibility that the Lord Jesus Christ gave to him as being the gospel, or excuse me, the apostle to the Gentile people. Now, the, the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, is primarily a Gentile body. Yes, there are Messianic Jews, uh, but again, in Christ there is no Jew or Gentile. Okay, uh, it's an individual salvation, okay? and so it is primarily a Gentile body. Okay, going on, even uh, though Paul is himself a Jew, okay, he laid aside the traditions of the Jews in order to be that ordained apostle. Uh, let's see, 1 Corinthians 9, 20 and 20 to, to 23. And under, well, we just read that. And again, he says, that, you know, under the Jews I became as a Jew. But he goes on and he tells us, look, every situation and scenario in which I, I was in, I found a way to be able to connect and to be able to communicate and to be able to empathize with those with whom I am witnessing to. Uh, and you have to do the same thing. A Christian's got to be able to speak and be able to relate to as many people okay, as you possibly can so you can reach as many as you possibly can. Now, The one thing you don't do in this case is compromise on doctrine and scripture uh, and standards to do that. Basically, uh, things like what Billy Graham did, that's what destroyed the Billy Graham Crusades, is compromising, uh, ec you know, going ecumenical uh, and you know, I mean, he's up there on the stage with with, <laughs> with Catholics and Seventh Day Adventists and Protestants and I mean the whole shebang. He's got liberals, you know, all kinds of non-denominational going on uh, because he thought it was going to give him a chance to reach more people. But then, at the end of the crusade, wherever they were, in a particular city, you know, people were being turned over to the local churches, including churches like the Seventh-day Adventist and the Roman Catholic Church. You know, so, you know, you, you've got to be willing to do what is reasonably scripturally necessary to reach people, but not at the cost of doing right. Alright, so we're going to end there for this evening. Uh, we're going